Hi everybody, how are you today? Thank you for listening to my YouTube channel and the podcast. We have amazing economist Tony Alexander from Tony Alexander and he will be giving us some updates on housing, inflation and etc etc which I don't understand but we'll see where we go. So hi Tony, how Alexander, how are you? Good, thanks. Yep, good. Happy to be online with yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, again, this is a big opportunity for me to interview you. So I'm feeling so blessed today. So you just made my day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much for that. Um, Tony, everyone knows you're the economist, but I would like to know who is Tony Alexander? Who am I? I'm a person who about an hour ago, I got back from doing a two and a half hour walk um, with my tramping pack on, no major weight, in, in a place uh, called Battle Hill, north of Wellington. So I like to be outside, basically, uh, doing things. I live on a 10-acre block north of the city, north of mm -hmm. Wellington. Uh, been here for almost three decades. And uh, uh, the first thing I did on the property was reduce its value by ripping out all the internal fences, because I don't like animals, basically. Um, and I dug, <laughs> I know, I, I like cats, they, they're, they're fine. Um, I dug 9,000 holes and just planted 9,000 of whatever would grow, native, exotic, deciduous, evergreen. And so we've got lots of different birds, etc. So I, I guess I like the outdoors. I like doing stuff with my, with my hands. And uh, what helps pay for all of uh, this, of course, is uh, my job as an economist, yeah. um, something I, I realised I enjoyed back in, I guess, the early 1980s. That's when it all started. So, in, uh, so you're uh, telling us you have so much experience, like it didn't start just like, you know, uh, I thought about doing economists. So what is your study background to become the economist? Yeah, okay, so I spent five years at University of Canterbury from 1980 to um, 84, uh, got a Bachelor of Arts degree and then a Master of Arts degree with uh, first class uh, honours, and uh, then uh, as soon as the exams were finished, uh, within three weeks I was working for the Reserve Bank of Australia um, in Sydney, um, that was really boring. I hated oh it to tears. Uh, some people, they like the, I guess, the academia. They work on uh, studies. It takes a long time. And they might produce one output in an entire year. Um, no, I need to produce outputs um, all the time. And so I left there after a few months and eventually joined Westpac as an economist eventually. Um, in Australia? In, in Australia still in 1985. I uh -huh. came back, back to New Zealand after two and a half years. So in the middle of 1987, I came back to New Zealand. All the reforms were underway. It all looked uh, uh, fairly exciting. Um, and of course, uh, about three or four months after I came back, we had a big share market crash uh, back in September or October 1987. That's interesting, one of the, in that one of the things I focus on a lot, of course, is the housing market. I talk about FOMO, fear of missing out, and I can attest to the power of FOMO because in the, uh, back in 1987, when I got back to New Zealand, and I came back to eventually buy some land, everybody was buying houses. It was at least as frenzied, I would suggest, back then as it has been now for the past you know, 15 or so months. And so I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to buy something now or I will never be able to buy anything. So um, the banks weren't very sophisticated at that time. I got four credit cards. I ran them all to the limit and I went to a different bank and said, I've got a deposit. And they said, yes, you have a deposit. Here, have some money for a mortgage. So uh, bought, bought my first house back then. But the main thing I just wanted to emphasize was that uh, FOMO. I was gripped strongly by FOMO. And that has been something which, of course, has been motivating people massively for the past 18 months in New Zealand and is still a key driving force at the moment. So, yeah, I've been back in New Zealand since 1987, initially with Westpac uh, and then basically the Bank of New Zealand, the BNZ, uh, from 1983 up until two years ago. And two years ago, uh, left basically to do my own thing and have a bit more fun generally. Yeah, and I see I have been following you since BNZ. So love your reports and how you do your surveys and all of those things. It's just amazing the information that you provide. So how did you end up, do, like, how do you do this? Like you send a survey, how does that happen? Okay, so when the first uh, lockdown came along last year, and uh, of course we're all worried about what does this mean for the economy, for unemployment, et cetera, I recalled that back during the global financial crisis of 2008, 
We had people predicting a massive collapse in New Zealand house prices and huge extended woe for the New Zealand economy. And I, and I remember thinking at the time, this is just wrong. New Zealand is in a very different position from other countries. And so I, I wrote back then in late 08, 2009, 2010, about all the many factors which would insulate our economy. Wouldn't make us grow rapidly, but it would help our economy. And so when the lockdown first nationwide one for New Zealand started in March last year, I thought, I think I'm going to do the same thing. Rather than emphasizing all the negatives, I'm going to be pointing out things like we would normally, us Kiwis, spend $10 billion traveling overseas. We can't go overseas. We're going to spend some of that money in New Zealand that will help our economy. So I started listing all these things and people obviously liked it. And when the lockdown started, I had about 2000 people signed up for my free uh, weekly publication called Tony's View, um, spat out the other end after seven weeks with 10,000 people uh, signed up. So it went viral, shall we say. And once, we, once I got, I think maybe to five or 6,000, I thought I can start asking people what they're thinking, what they're feeling um, out there. And so I started one survey I'm still doing each month about what are you planning to spend money on more or less in the next few months? Uh, you know, why are you going to spend more or less? So that's the spending plan survey. I also started up one of real estate agents asking them, are you seeing the buyers out there? Are they investors? Are they first home buyers? Are you seeing FOMO? Uh, why are buyers buying? What are they worried about? So I started that survey up as well. I think a few months later, I started up one of mortgage advisors. And my aim with the um, uh, residential market uh, surveys in particular is to get right at the coalface, right yeah. at what's happening at the moment. Uh, for instance, if you have a look at data coming out from some of the agencies out there, it's quite backward looking. It's telling us where prices were moving two or three months ago. The media reported like it's today. No, 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 it's, it's out of date. And so I try to get to the coalface and just deliver that sort of information to people in a language that they can easily understand. I'm not trying to impress anybody with great knowledge or words. Um, it's all about the communication. And in the end, I'm not really saying, uh, listen to what I say and you can make lots of money. It's more pay attention to the things I'm saying and what I'm seeing, because I think they can help you avoid making an obvious mistake. I come at this from a slightly different point of view rather than give me your money and I can make you more money or that sort of a thing. It's, it's a different emphasis. Definitely. And I even saw the, uh, today uh, there, was a, there was an article about inflation. They say in, unemployment drops to 3.4% and economy adds 54,000 jobs while wage inflation highest in decade. What does that mean exactly? Um, Okay, rightio. So let's start by looking at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. They, they are responsible for trying to keep inflation between 1% and 3%. And in order to achieve that, they will raise interest rates or lower interest rates. And so if they see a lot of inflation coming along, they'll raise interest rates to make people think, oh, borrowing money is a bit expensive. I won't borrow so much. I won't spend so much retailing slows down, construction falls away, the economy slows down, and so inflation edges off a bit. And if it's the opposite, such as you know the, the global pandemic, when the Reserve Bank and everybody's worried, or, oh my goodness, inflation may go below zero, which is deflation, and they slashed interest rates to try and encourage people to do spending, which we've done on each other's houses, spas, gazebos, electric bikes, so very, very successful. Now, here's the problem. The Reserve Bank was right to cut interest rates aggressively last year in March um, and remove the LVRs, the loan to value ratios. But late last year, there were very strong signs that our economy was doing well. The labor market was strong. House prices were going through the roof. And the Reserve Bank should have started raising interest rates again very early this year. But they, they didn't. And they have left uh, monetary policy in New Zealand too loose for too long. And the outcome is that 
six months ago, the Reserve Bank were going, things look okay. We think in six months time, our inflation rate will be 2.5%. It's 4.9%. I've never seen a central bank make such a large uh, uh, prediction uh, error. So they've overcooked the economy and one aspect of our economy being overcooked, growing beyond its capacity to, to, to keep growing without a lot of inflation is in the labor market. And the unemployment rate has fallen to a, a record low since these data started in 1986 of 3.4%. And the 54,000 increase in job numbers in the September quarter, there's only one other quarter back in 2016 when job numbers grew by more in a three-month period. That was 62,000, I think, back then. So our economy is growing too rapidly. The Reserve Bank have overcooked it and they need to be raising interest rates. So while all of us pretty much smile about, boy, the labour market is, uh, is strong, so it's good from a wage earner point of view, but if you're an employer, not the case at all. You already can't find staff. And I've been really strongly for the past year saying to employers, you better make sure you've got your staff on board, boost their wages, give them free fish and chips on a Friday because this labour market is going to tighten up. And then when the borders open up, we're going to go to Australia. A whole generation, I think, of young people is going to Australia over the next uh, two to three years. So the implication of all that, the good job numbers today is wages growth will pick up, um, the inflation rate will remain high. And that partly is why for over 12 months now, I've been jumping up and down very strongly saying, if you're looking at borrowing money, getting a mortgage, beware the candy of a one year fixed mortgage rate at 2.19%. Personally, that's how I couch it. Personally, I would fix for five years at 2.99%. Hardly anybody did. Us Kiwis, we, we just borrow at whatever the lowest rate is, by, by and large. Um, and now, of course, interest rates have already gone up one to one and a half percent. Bank mortgage rates, there's a lot more coming. The Reserve Bank is going to have to run an interest rate shock through the economy in the next two years to slow down our pace of growth. Because if they don't, you, you and I, we're going to be saying, you know, maybe inflation doesn't average 2% any longer. Oh, maybe it's going to average 4%. That's a disaster. As soon as the Reserve Bank thinks it's lost control of the inflation sort of outlook, they will react. So my warning today remains that uh, even though these employment numbers are so fantastic, uh, but it does mean interest rates will go higher than would otherwise have been the case. And if I were a borrower at the moment, I'd probably fix personally maybe three years. That's probably what I'd have a look at. Yeah, I, I've seen that some people have, have come back to me telling me their interest rate has gone up by 1%. And how does that affect to the mortgage brokers at the moment? Okay, yeah, this is where it gets interesting. So stay with me on this bit here. Now, interest rates are going up. And most of us are saying, uh, it's not going to cause house prices to fall. Um, it's not going to be a big problem. And we're saying things like, well, look, the unemployment rate is 3.4%. So the outlook for the economy is good. Dairy prices are at record levels. Again, the outlook for the economy um, um, is good. We're saying if you borrowed money from the bank recently at, let's say, 2.5%, the bank didn't lend you the money unless they could be certain you could service an interest rate of 55 or even up to 6.5%. So people like me are saying interest rates have gone up. But don't worry too much about that uh, because the, the household sector finances can handle it. That's the problem. You see, the Reserve Bank has introduced in recent years loan to value ratios. They've made uh, banks hold higher capital so that when a shock comes along to our economy, uh, foot and mouth, global pandemic, something like that, um, we, we don't spiral downward. People's household finances are solid and things will be okay. There's a problem. The shock, which will now be running through the economy, it's not disease. It's not new trade barriers. It's, it's not a collapse in overseas economies. It's coming from the Reserve Bank itself. They need to raise interest rates. They have created an environment where the increase in interest rates, uh, it's going to take a while before it really has a lot of impact out there. And yep. that is one thing I'm writing quite strongly at the moment, just warning people, the fact that people like me are saying increase in interest rates, it's going to be okay. House price inflation slows down, but it's not too major. That's part of the problem. It means the Reserve Bank is going to have to push relatively hard in, eventually. 
raising mm -hmm. interest rates to slow the economy down. And so that's why I'm still a fan of fixing, like I say, maybe three, three years and why I'm warning people, work out your budget with interest rates, your mortgage rate 2% higher than if you were borrowing today at 3.5%, work out how you'd service 5.5%. Um, and if you decide for you it's easy and all your friends it's easy, run 6.5% because one way or the other, the Reserve Bank will slow down the pace of growth in our economy. They will get inflation back under control and it will be done by interest rates. So just be careful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I also seen uh, today we received a survey from you today regarding the house, uh, real estate agents. So what was all, uh, what was that all about? Okay, so this is the uh, survey I do of real estate agents around the country uh, with the REINZ. Usually get about 350 responses from agents all around the country. That's why I asked them about FOMO, fear of missing out, you know, this sort of thing. And so some of the key points would be uh, a gross 70, 70% of the agents are saying they see FOMO on the part of buyers. Uh, that's pretty much the same as one month ago and two months ago. So nothing major there. And it's pretty much equal to the average reading for that for the past 18 months. So FOMO has been really strong for 18 months. It remains strong. Um, secondly, uh, a net 60% of business, uh, sorry, agents saying prices are rising in their location. So that's relatively strong. It's also equal to the average of the past 18 months. So I look at that and it, go, it says to me, prices are still rising at a very strong uh, pace out there. Third point would be um, investors. Now the investor buyers, they stood back from the market late in March. After the March 23 announcement on tax changes for interest uh, deductibility, the investors stood back they remain, remain standing back. The first home buyers, they sort of pulled back a bit as well. It wasn't quite so relevant to them, but that's sort of in, in, in balance. So those sort of indicators are out there showing fundamentally the market is still very strong and the anecdotes, the comments which the agents uh, make show that basically people are still scrambling to buy whatever they can. The only real thing of interest to me in the latest survey results is I'm starting to see evidence of a few more vendors going, look, my house price is 35% higher than uh, March of last year. Maybe that's enough. Maybe I will sell one of my investment properties. Maybe I want to get on with my life now. Maybe I will sell, buy, whatever. So I think the listings numbers will start improving over the next uh, few months. That frankly is probably my main outtake from the survey, you know, just out. And as you as you know, because I have heard some people telling me the uh, don't buy now, wait for some time because December or maybe January onwards the price is going to go down and the rent's going to go down. Is this the case, or what do you think about that? Sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing. I've been hearing stories like this for over three decades. Uh, when I came back to New Zealand in, uh, like I say, 1987, there was a, a high profile economist. I remember listening to him speak in 1988 and I came away scared. Oh, my God, I should never buy a house because he said the prices are going to collapse. <laughs> they did not collapse. We've had so many other people repeatedly over the past three decades say, oh, you don't want to buy housing. Go into shares instead or house prices just fell 34% in the United States and 60% in Ireland. So they're going to collapse 40% in New Zealand, but you know our circumstances are fundamentally very different. Um, but we, as interest rates go up now, we will have people coming out of the woodwork again, uh, saying, oh, I'm going to be right this time. I mean, they've been wrong for three decades, four decades. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be right now, the prices will collapse. Well, no, I don't think the prices are going to, to collapse. As a rule in New Zealand, house prices on average only fall when interest rates rise strongly and that causes a recession. I do think interest rates will rise strongly. I'm not convinced of a recession as yet. Hey, it's possible three years down the track, but I'm not convinced. So if I were buying at the moment, my I guess I'd be wary of the level of debt and I'd try to get a feeling for how much am I driven by blind FOMO? Am I just looking to buy anything at all to simply be like anybody else? My comment, if I had you know, any of my sort of five kids looking at buying in the near future, um, would be, by all means, if your finances are up to it, make your purchase, but 
I think there'll be a better range to choose from in six, nine, 12 months time. But I do think they'll be higher in price. So if, if price is the key issue, there's no incentive to wait. But if your finances are pretty good and you can't see what you want out there at the moment, I might be inclined to wait because I think more vendors are going to come forward slowly through summer, but especially next year in autumn and through winter as well. Yes, and uh, what uh, what do you think the eco uh, right now effect has had because of Auckland being in lock lockdown for a, approximately three months now? So what do you think is happening and what, what do you think we'll see in future as well happening because yeah. of that on economy? Yeah, yeah, I mean, when we had our first nationwide lockdown um, last year, we didn't know what it meant. Now we know what it means. We go out and uh, we, we stockpile our toilet paper, our food, our pets, and then, and then we hire each other's employees and we buy each other's houses. And so this time around with lockdown in, in Auckland still uh, ongoing, uh, people are not frightened of the economy collapsing. They expect a strong bounce back once the doors open up um, again. And so people have remained actively engaged in the housing market. So if we go back to that monthly survey with the REINZ, I mentioned that for the country as a whole, FOMO, the proportion of agents saying, they see fear of missing out on the part of buyers. For the country overall, it's 70, 70%. In Auckland, it's 79%. Canterbury, I think, is 85%. So Auckland, it's got above average FOMO. And what I find interesting is if we have a look at the month of September, Auckland house prices on average rose only 0.9%. The rest of the country, it was about 2.7%. And I look at that and I think, you know what? I think there's a catch up to come in Auckland when Aucklanders are freed up. I think there's going to be some catch up buying and some extra upward pressure on prices over the next uh, few months. And Auckland is actually still, it's, it's not like it was late in 2016. In late 2016, Auckland house prices had doubled over about a five year period. The rest of the country, uh, it was only just getting going. So if this is some concept of average of Auckland versus the country, Auckland was well above average. Yeah. Now, Auckland is below its average ratio with the rest of the country. So I'm talking a lot about Auckland, but hey, that's where two thirds of the residential property value stock um, is. Um, I think uh, once Auckland comes out of lockdown, there's going to be some catch up buying, extra prices, pressure, uh, but people should be strongly aware of this. This is the end game. This is the end of the boom in house prices, whether you're starting 18 months ago, prices up 35%, uh, about 10 years ago, prices up about 170%, or you're going all the way back to 1992 when prices have increased about 680%. It's over and done with. We will not see prices increasing at that rate going forward. Uh, the LVRs are back stronger than ever, new tax regulations, house supply is going through the uh, roof. I think a lot of young people are going to go to Australia in the next few years. And of course, interest rates are coming off Three decades of falling. Interest rates sort of falling for three decades, it's finished. Now they rise for the next few years. So when I'm when I'm saying Auckland comes out of lockdown and the prices rise, I'm only talking a few months. And then those five factors I mentioned, they're going to come into play. And the most interesting thing for Auckland, just to finish up on, uh, for next year is going to be this. At some point, people generally are going to say, I wonder if the shortage has gone. I wonder if we could have an oversupply of houses in Auckland. Now, I've seen two people say that so far. People don't, don't believe it, but housing moves in cycles. House prices move in cycles. House construction, house sales, they move in cycles. And the downward cycle for the construction, it's somewhere down the track. Uh, for the sales, it'll come along as well. And one element will be eventually people saying, you know, Auckland's population, shrank 0.1% last year. How can you have a short shortage if your population is shrinking eventually? That's what I'm interested in for 2022 for, for Auckland. The rest of the country, uh, it's a slightly different situation. Yes, it is. And uh, one last question. Uh, uh, the way Labour has bring up this uh, capitalist tax rule, 
the, the, what one? the tax the they're going to tax on the investment properties that you have the capitalist tax i think okay, I, so the uh, you lose the ability to deduct your interest expenses and there is the bright line test if you sell within well 10 years now yeah and you have to pay tax on setting on on any of the investment properties what yeah. do you think about that oh okay basically governments in new zealand let housing become a portfolio asset so when I say portfolio assets, and I've got a monthly survey specifically on these things as well, you're thinking, I could buy shares, I could buy cryptos, I could buy precious metal, artwork, old cars, uh, government bonds, you know, property, commercial property, etc. And over the past 30 years, people have decided, actually, I'm going to get ready for my retirement by buying someone else's house. And I will rent it out to tenants. And the story for New Zealand's housing market for the past three decades has been an increasing proportion of the ownership going towards people using them as, uh, as, as investments. Now, it's taken a long time for New Zealand governments, I think, to realise that most of us are living in New Zealand not to make a lot of money. I came back to New Zealand in 1987 because I wanted to see change in seasons. I wanted to get really cold sometimes without having to go to Canberra, south of Sydney. Um, I wanted to see trees other than gum trees, other than eucalyptus, et cetera. So I knew I was sacrificing income to come back here. And if you're in New Zealand, you're probably here for some version of a lifestyle. And part of our lifestyle is home ownership, in my opinion. Overseas, you live in a big city, you rent an apartment maybe for your entire life, you, you get the buzz from the city, it's a great thing. And so I think New Zealand governments have sort of taken too long to acknowledge we're here because we like the lifestyle, I want to own a property, and they should have, I think, altered the taxation status of um, investment properties a long time ago. Do it steadily over time. But of course, this government, a majority Labour government, they've got in their mind a large mandate, they've, they've moved relatively quickly. And so the March 23 announcement was quite a surprise there. I wasn't surprised by extending the bright line test from uh, five years to, what was it, seven years, five years to, to 10. And the warning I've been giving, and I, I think I'll finish up with this warning as well. This is the warning I started giving about one week after March 23. A majority Labour government had surprised everybody by saying, we're removing deductibility of your interest expense immediately for new purchases um, and over the next four years for your existing investments. If we get to, I don't know, March next year and house prices are still rising strongly, I wouldn't put it past this government to go, you know, we took away the ability of investors to deduct interest expense and they've still kept on buying. What if we took away everything else? What if we took away their ability to deduct local authority rates, insurance, property management fees? Now, I don't think they'd be that bullshit. I don't think they would do that. But I do warn people that this government has failed with regard to housing policy. And I know that bugs them. And since you know, 18 months ago, house prices are up 35%. Don't rule out that there will be some further tax changes relevant to the returns which investors can get on residential property um, over time. I, I have no inside knowledge of it at all, but if it were to happen, I'd go, yeah, I gave that a 50% probability. And that's probably all I give it, a 50% chance. They are instead mainly concentrating on trying to boost supply. I'll give a warning on the supply side as well. Um, it's gonna take maybe a couple of years before the ability in our top five cities to build three-story properties, three of them, to, to show through an increased supply, it won't make much difference in the near future because you can't get a carpenter anyway. You can't get four by two and jib board and pink bats and you know glue for the plywood laminates, et cetera. So um, it won't make all that much difference. But let me go back to something I said about five or seven minutes ago. Housing markets move in cycles. And one of the cycles is house construction. And we have before been in this climate where everyone's saying population growth is strong, there's a shortage, build, build, build. We've got to build as many as quickly as possible. The last time this happened was in the first half of the 1970s. House construction boomed and then economic problems came along and house construction collapsed. Now, I don't think we're going to see a collapse this time around, but as the banks tighten up on their lending, and banks are already tightening up on lending, 
for people to buy a new build because no one's got the foggiest idea what the final cost is going to be, uh, for yeah. instance. You know, it's going to eventually cause some issues for builders, uh, construction companies. And so from, uh, from a banker's, a lender's point of view, the bankers will be looking at all their loans out to builders and going, maybe we just need to tighten up there a bit because we've got a few gray-haired people in the back there and one or two of them were there in the 1970s. Many of them were, were there after 1987 and those people are saying, We've been here before. Let's just be a little bit careful about there's a downward cycle eventually in construction. Maybe that's two to three years out. It's certainly not a story for next year, but there we go. Just a little bit of a warning to some of the builders out there. Make sure you've got your debt under control because eventually the banks are going to tighten up on you next two to three years. And uh, one last tip. Can you give us a tip? Where should we invest? Should we tip, uh, invest in shares, houses, crypto? whatever you think is good. Invest in what you understand. Your worst enemy when it comes to investing is putting your money into something because every man and his dog is doing the same thing, but you don't understand what makes it go up or go down. And the risk then is that when it goes down, for whatever reason, you, you, you're shocked and you go, oh my God, it's gone down. I'd better sell before it goes down further. Now, let me give you an example. A lot of people in March last year, when the share markets fell about 35%, after they had fallen by 35%, a lot of new younger people in particular, it's like a miracle happened. And the miracle was after the market fell 35%, they gained an ability to predict share prices they did not have eight weeks earlier. And their prediction became, it's going to fall another 35%. And so they sold. They went from growth funds to conservative funds. No, no miracle happened. They didn't get an improved forecasting ability. What they got was a shock from something they hadn't been in the market long enough. They didn't understand. That's what share markets do. It's in their nature. They go up, they go down, and the trend is strongly upward over time. So if you invest in something and you, and you don't have experience of how it goes up and down over time, when an inevitable down comes along, you'll probably panic you'll sell out and you will crystallize your loss because you are gripped by the opposite of FOMO, of buying a thing, of got to sell. And in fact, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll think of a name for that at some stage, but uh, whatever the opposite of FOMO is, that's what gripped people in the share market, younger and experienced people last year. So whatever investment people are looking at, make sure you understand what motivates changes in prices. If you can't do that, then maybe you want to stick to some other, other assets. Thank you so much for your time. And the, just one thing that I would like to do is five takeaways from Tony Alexander. Kind, maybe in, in terms of motivation, in terms of uh, business or anything you would say, or as an investment. Okay, right here. Um, first, firstly, um, I forgot to say, um, if you want to receive my free weekly publication called Tony's View, there's 23,000 people get that now, just go to tonyalexander.nz and you can sign up, go for your life there. So nothing too major there. Oh, five. I have, I have yeah. signed up. Oh, good. Well done. Okay. <laughs> um, a number of takeaways. Um, number one, expose your kids uh, to as many different experiences um, as possible. Because uh, if, unless they get to do something, they may not find out that they're actually good at it, they enjoy it, other people value it, etc. So try and expose your kids to a whole range of experiences um, out, out there and be wary about uh, only focusing on the things you're bad at. If Tiger Woods had uh, somebody say to him, oh, you know, good speaking Spanish, and if he had spent three hours a day learning Spanish, he wouldn't have had as much time to devote to learning golf and becoming for a while, you know, the world's best. So get a range of experiences um, for, for young people. Um, number two, get into KiwiSaver. Um, it's not just in terms of providing for your retirement somewhere uh, down the track, but also, of course, for young people, um, it's a good way of saving and building up a deposit uh, towards, towards your first house. So yeah, get yourself into KiwiSaver as well. Uh, number three, remember housing markets move in cycles. We've had the mother of all increasing phases of the cycle for the past 18 months, 10 years, 30 years. There's a downward cycle to come along. I don't think it's going to be something horrible, but it does suggest the returns, capital gains going forward will be less generous than has been the case over any of those time periods. So it, be prepared to take some risk off the table. And for your guide, the professional investors who maybe they've got a portfolio of 15 or 50 houses, 
They've already been selling off their rubbish this year, stuff which needs $50,000 to meet healthy homes requirements or whatever. They've been selling it into the frenzy, not trying to pick the peak. They've been selling it you know, at frenzied auctions along the way. So maybe that's the uh, third thing, I suppose, uh, uh, one could say. Um, fourth thing, uh, this too will pass. Uh, it was one of those fables or something in the past from, I think, centuries or millennia uh, ago. Um, we all go through bad times, and Auckland's bad time at the moment is definitely um, quite extended. And of course, for people in the tourism, the hospitality, uh, accommodation uh, sectors, we, we humans, basically, as far as we know, we are the top species on this uh, planet, subject to the aliens coming along and handing it all over to the white mice or the dolphins. Um, and we are the top species because we're the most adaptable. We're being hit by all sorts of changes in our communities, our, our environments, our personal lives. And the measure of a person is your ability to get back up again after being um, knocked down. We adapt. We've already extensively adapted the way we do businesses, uh, you know, Zooming, et cetera, um, shopping online to initial impacts of the global pandemic, and we'll need to continue to adapt uh, going forward. And maybe I'll just make that my final comment uh, as well, that there are management experts out there, I'm not one of them, but the gurus, uh, they say things along the lines of the speed of change in your operating environment is the fastest you've ever seen compared with previous years. It's probably also the slowest you'll ever see for the next five, 10, you know, 50 years going forward. We humans are innovative. We're looking for different ways to do things all the time and never assume that your operating environment will be stable. Try and get ahead of the curve in terms of recognizing where, where the change is gonna come from, from your customers, your competitors, their production, their distribution uh, practices, et cetera. And in or, partly in order to stay on top of all of that, you need good, young people working in your organization. I mean, I don't do social media, okay? This is probably the closest I've ever come to doing it. I, I was on Facebook once for, I think it was 36 hours, and then I couldn't figure it out, and I thought, nah, not for me. Um, <laughs> you, you, people, uh, businesses, if you've got a lot of gray hairs there running the place, you need to have young people who are aware of all the different technologies out there, and young people, when they go through school these days, it's not just rote learning sort of thing. Um, do this and you become a chef. Do this, you can be a carpenter. It's do this and the world literally is the oyster. You can do a lot of different tasks along the way. And so get some of these young people on board because they're going to see things from a different angle and different ways of doing things that maybe you just can't uh, think of. All you got to do is get them before they go to Australia because there's two years worth of OE to catch up on. Um, and Australia's cheaper houses, lower cost of living, higher wages. So sorry to finish up on that note, but, but for the employers out there, you think it's bad at the moment, you ain't seen nothing yet. Your next five years will be even more challenging. Thank you so much, Tony, for your time today. And it's a pleasure talking to you and understanding a lot about housing, economy, where we are going and all of those things. But thank you. And I will send you the link for the interview as well as the podcast details so that you can listen to it. And thank you so much again for your time. Thanks really appreciate much. that. And honestly, that. you're such a big personality, but you still gave me time. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. All the best. Ta -da, thank everybody. you. See, see ya.